So the next thing we're going to take a look at are these things called functions. Okay, and once again, my guess is you've, you know, been toying around with functions in one class or another for quite a while. Um, but in, in calculus, uh, much like in, in pre-calculus, uh, we do need a little bit more formal of a definition, okay? But in order to have a formal definition, we, we need an idea of what we're going for, right? Of, of what's kind of getting us, um, of, of what's sort of motivating this idea, okay? And so functions talk about the relationship between known quantities or various objects, right? You might have, um, uh, you might have a, you know, function that relates um, the size of a bacteria population to time, right? You might have a function that relates, um, you know, uh, the length of a vocabulary list to number of hours spent studying. Right, you might have a um, function that relates um, an item to its cost, right? Um, and so, so if it's governing these ideas of relationships, right, um, that's sort of where we get this definition here, okay? So a function, I'll highlight this. I'm notoriously uh, very bad at remembering to highlight the words we're defining. Okay, but a function is a rule that assigns to each output in the set A um, one and only one, this is important, uh, element in a set B, okay? And so why is it so important that it's one and only one, right? Let's think about um, the function that the scanners, you know, use um, when you go into like a target, right? Um, there, there, there's a function going on in there where it inputs, right, the um, barcode of the item and it outputs the price. Well, if this object in set A, right, being the barcode, if that was mapped to more than one price, what's the scanner going to do, right? Is, you know, the pack of bubblegum going to cost a dollar and two dollars? That doesn't make very much sense, right? Um, and so that's why we only restrict it to one output, right? Two inputs can have the same output, right? Um, if you have, there'll, there'll be sort of two pictures that we'll, we'll come back to with functions. If we have these two, you know, amoeba sets like this, right? Um, you, you can picture F as, as a mapping between them, right? You have some element here, call it X. You have some element here. And what F does is F takes in an element from this set A and gives you an element in set B, right? Um, where if this input is X, we write the output um, as F of X. Right. And so under these mappings, right, you can't have something like this where X gets taken to two different spots. You can have um, something like this, right, where, where maybe Y is right there. And we can have um, Y get mapped to the same place. Right. You know, um, two totally different bags of Doritos with different barcodes, those can have the same price, right? There's, there's nothing um, strange about that, okay? To give us a little bit more vocabulary here, um, our set A is 
uh, that's called the domain. And what A is, is it's our set of valid inputs, right? That's our domain. Okay, we'll, we'll explain the domain in a little bit more detail next. Um, and there's one other picture that I want to in, introduce you to beyond this like amoeba. Um, and that uh, thinks about F as more of a like transformation slash machine, right? So you've got some, you've got some box, right? It's called F. And it's got, say, an input and an output, right? What, what goes into F are my inputs from A, right? Our, our elements from A, we can feed them into our function. And our output, well, our output, those are going to be elements of B, right? There's no guarantee that we're going to hit all of B, right? None at all. Um, think about the function, um, you know, f of x equals 2, right? Our input is going to be the whole real, real number line, right? But our output is just going to be the set 2. That's all it's going to hit, okay? And so, so if we're not guaranteed to hit all of B, that's where we get the idea of a range, right? I'm gonna, before I write down the definition, I'm going to move this B up here just so it's not confusing. Our range is the following set, right? Our range is the set of all of my f of x's such that x is an a. Right. If you're not familiar with this sort of set notation, um, drop by my office hours or shoot me an email. Um, it was uh, this sort of notation is covered in 118. Um, but if you don't remember, shoot me an email um, and we can chat about it. But essentially what this is saying is that my, my range is everything that looks like f of x where x is an a. So our, our range is everything that's actually hit by our function f, okay? Um, for the sake of this class, um, it, it is helpful to have the like amoeba picture, this machine picture is really helpful as well, okay? Um, but in our class, um, almost exclusively, um, we will take both a and b to be, able to be the real numbers, right? We're, not too often going to be dealing with, you know, wacky sets there um, because this is calculus, right? Where we're working in the real numbers. Okay. So let's take a look at some examples, right? Um, we've had a few spoken examples as far as functions, but let's actually write a couple down um, for ones that have to do with the real numbers. Okay. So let's say f of x equals, say, 2x squared uh, minus x plus 1, okay? And you probably re remember this, but we can talk about evaluating a function at a point, right? So this function, right, this takes in an x and it spits out this guy, right? Just sort of like our machine picture here. So say we want to evaluate uh, f of negative 2, right? And this means plug negative 2 in for x and see what you get, right? That's not too complicated. We're going to have 2 times minus 2 squared minus a minus 2 plus 1. Minus 2 squared is going to be a positive 4 times 2 is going to be 8. Minus a minus 2 is going to be a plus 2 plus 1. And it looks to me like that final answer is going to be 11, okay? Let's look at something a little bit more abstract, okay? What if we do f of a plus h, 
Now, now this may seem a little bit different, um, but to evaluate this, all we need to do is follow, you know, the same sorts of steps. And since we're plugging in a plus h for x, that means everywhere that I see a, everywhere I see x, I should put in an a plus h, right? And we can evaluate this, right? What's a plus h squared? Well, that's going to be a squared plus 2ah plus h squared. Uh, we're going to have minus a minus h plus 1. Distributing in my 2, it looks like we have 2a squared plus 4ah plus 2h squared minus a minus h plus 1. Okay. And that's as simplified as, as it gets. There's no sort of um, common factors here. So this is our evaluation of f evaluated at a plus h. So now let's, let's sort of drill down a little bit into this concept of domain. So if, if we think about um, f as a machine, right, this, this sort of function machine, um, then my, my domain is all of the things that I can put into the machine without it breaking, okay? So let's say we have the following machine, right? Let's say we have f of x equals one over x, right? We can say, put two into our machine. Well, when I put two out of the machine, we're gonna do one over two or one half. Right? I can put negative 5, I can put pi, I can put a bunch of things into this machine and it's not going to break. Um, but like, as a like trivial example, right, into this machine, it definitely breaks if I try to put the number cow, right? If I try to put a cow through this machine, it's not going to work right? Cow is outside of our domain, the function breaks, okay? Well, that's a simple thing, right? This was defined in numbers, and this is an animal, so clearly it's not going to work. But there's a little bit sneakier one sometimes, right? What about zero, right? Well, cow broke because our function isn't defined on, on cow, right, as an input. Um, if I put in zero, well, it seems like we should be able to evaluate it, right? That's a number. But when I put in zero, I get one over zero, which as we said in the last part, isn't defined, right? It doesn't matter what math class you're in, you can't divide by zero, okay? So that's not defined either, right? And that tells us that zero is outside of our domain, right? If we're, if we're taking, our set A in, in this class to be the real numbers, right? Well, then we don't need to think about anything like this, you know, cow or whatever. But we do need to think about situations like this. Because zero is a real number, but it can't be in the domain of our function because our function can't be defined there, okay? Um, and so that, that's a little bit of a simpler example. So let's let's take a look at something that's a little bit more involved, okay, so give the domain the IN of the following functions, okay. So let's take a look at our first one, okay. What is the domain of say f of x equals the square root of one minus x, okay. So our first question is always, how could this go wrong, right? Is, is there a way that some input of this is going to get really nasty and things are going to stop working, okay? Similar to how zero makes this guy stop working. Well, subtracting one is fine for any, any real number. So, so it's not going to be the x minus one. However, Think about this square root. This square root function, since we're only ever working over the real numbers, 
the square root function is only defined for positive inputs. Okay. We, we can only put positive numbers into it, which means that our domain is subject to the following restriction. X minus 1 has to be greater than or equal to 0. Right? And that's because the input of our function has to be greater than 0. It can be equal to 0. The square root of 0 is 0. But so, so whatever this is has to be subject to that, which then means my domain, well, it's everywhere that x is greater than or equal to 0. OK? What about g of x is 1 over x squared minus 4? Right? So our, our first question is, well, how could this break? Right? And unlike the last one, we're not dealing with any square roots, so that's totally fine. But we are dealing with a division by zero case, right? This guy breaks if we're dividing by zero. So we can say the bad case is when x squared minus 4 equals zero, which means x squared equals 4, or x is positive or negative 2, right? Because positive or negative 2 squared is 4, 4 minus 4 is 0, and we're in trouble, okay? So that means that our domain is everywhere except x equals positive 2 and negative 2, okay? And there's a number of different ways to write this, right, to, to, to write the domain, giving the exceptions, um, writing the actual areas where it's defined, writing as a set. Um, in, in this case, something like that is totally sufficient. Okay. And we'll do one last one that we can squeeze onto the bottom of this page. What about h of x is x squared plus 2? Well, the obvious question is, where could this go wrong? And you can stare at it and stare at it. But if you consider it for long enough, you'll realize, well, this is fine everywhere, right? There's no square roots. There's no possibility of division by zero. So our domain here is the entire real numbers um, represented by this blackboard R, right? With sort of two lines on the R, OK? So let's take a look at one more example that's a little bit more involved. So let's say you're, you're in this situation, right? You're, you're constructing an open top box from a 16 inch by 10 inch piece of cardboard, okay? And you're doing this by cutting away a series of squares that are X by X inches from each corner um, and then folding up the flaps, right? So you're doing something like this. You're starting with a piece of cardboard. Maybe it looks like this. You're cutting away these corners that are x by x inches, right? That, that's going to be the size of these squares. And then you're sort of folding these up to end up with this rectangular box that maybe looks a little something like this, okay? Where, you know, these creases here come from right there, okay? Although I guess technically those two come from those two, don't they? Um, so we're asked to find a function v of x, right, that gives us the volume of this box and state its domain, okay? And whenever you encounter these sorts of situations, the biggest thing to do is draw a picture and label everything you know and see what else you can determine from that, okay? So we know that this guy, each of these boxes in the corners are x by x, right? We also know that the cardboard box itself is 16 by 10. Okay. 
and we're looking for the volume. Well, if we're looking for the volume of this guy, right? What's the volume of a rectangular prism like that? Well, it's this length times this length times that length. So we need to find expressions for this guy, this guy, and this guy. So how can we do that? Well, we know that this here is going to be this, right, after we, we fold up. So that one's nice and simple. That, that, that one's just x, OK? This one right here, well, we said that that was going to be this one. But we know the whole thing is 16, and we're taking away x, and we're taking away x, right? So that would then mean that this length right here, well, it's going to be 16 minus 2x. Similarly, this guy right here is going to be 10 minus 2x. And all of a sudden, well, we have our thing, right? Because we know this thing here, right? This is 16 minus 2x, and this is 10 minus 2x. So we can state that my volume as a function of x, right? Well, it's going to be 16 minus 2x times 10 minus 2x times x. Okay, length times width times height. Okay, when you foil these two guys, what are we going to get? It looks like 160 um, plus 20 plus 32 for 52 x's. And looks like we're going to add, sorry, that should be minus 52 x's and 4x squared and then an extra x on the outside. So when we distribute that in and then rearrange, looks like we're going to have 4x cubed minus 52x squared plus 160. Okay. So that's what we're left with, right? This is our function. But now the question is, what's our domain, right? We, we can't just plug in any x for this, right? Because, like, like, what would happen if I plugged in x equals negative 1? That would mean that I was cutting out an, an area here that was negative 1 units by, by negative 1 units. That's nonsensical, right? Similarly, if x equals 1,000, right, I can't cut 1,000 by 1,000 corner off of a 16 by 10 sheet, right? That doesn't make any sense, okay? So, so we know like two values where it doesn't work, right? If it's smaller than negative one, we're definitely broken. If it's bigger than a thousand, we're also definitely broken. And the reason for that is, right, is that the sides of these boxes, right, all have to be greater than or equal to zero, right? You, you can't make sense of any sort of negative side length, okay? So, that means that our domain is subject to the following restrictions, right? 16 minus 2x is greater than or equal to 0. And 10 minus 2x is greater than or equal to 0. And, well, x has to be greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so what's happening now, right? Well, if I solve these inequalities, right, for this one, we're going to subtract 16 and then divide by negative 2. We're going to get that x is less than or equal to 8, okay? Similarly, on this one, we're going to get x is less than or equal to 5. And here, we still have x is greater than or equal to 0. So all of these need to hold, right? We need x is less than or equal to 8 and x is less than or equal to 5, and x is greater than or equal to 0. Well, if we're less than or equal to 5, we're definitely less than or equal to 8. And so we're looking for where both of these hold. 
zero is less than or equal to x. It's precisely this inequality here, or if you prefer the interval zero, five inclusive, okay? So that is, like I said, a little bit more in, in, involved than our previous examples, but you know, we're sort of beginning to stretch these, these logical muscles of you know, building this sort of model and looking at the functions and the domains and all of that, okay? The last thing that we're gonna take a look at today are graphs. So if you recall um, from the previous part, the Cartesian plane, uh, gives us two copies of the real number line, right? One on the x-axis, one on the y-axis. And we can use this to graph our functions, okay? Um, because if our domain is a real number, right? And our range is a subset of the real numbers as well, right? Then, then we can form these ordered pairs, right? And that allows us to graph uh, um, all of our functions. So let's sort of write that down, right? Given f of x, right? Or given, give, given a function f, f will say from the real numbers to the real numbers, right? We can graph f as the set of ordered pairs x and f of x, right? Where x is in our domain And this sort of gives us um, a really nice thing, right? Because it allows us to actually visually see what our function is doing, right? Say we have a function, it's doing something like this, right? Um, one of the things that I, I hope um, you're comfortable with that we'll, we'll sort of be using a lot um, in, in, in calculus is general functions like this. They're just doing something here, right? Uh, we will absolutely do, do a lot of work um, with you know, specific polynomials and rationals and all of that. But oftentimes when we're trying to get the gist of what's happening, we're gonna look at you know, some generic squiggle like that, okay? And what this function tells us, this is going to give us tons of information, right? Well, first of all, I, I, I can take a look at it and, and I, can immediate, I can immediately get our domain, right? Because our domain is everywhere that my function is defined. So if I simply just project all of this down to the x-axis, right? Because the x-axis is our domain. Well, all of that green stuff, that's our domain, right? Similarly, I can get a picture of the range, right? Say we'll do that in, in purple. I can go down here and see, okay, well, the lowest it gets is about here. So I can project that over to say there. I guess I have the nice dotted line to make that nicer. Okay, that's where our biggest point is. And so that means that this purple area, this purple area here is our range. Right, and then for the sake of labeling, our green is our domain. And for any point X in our domain, right? I'm curious what, say, f of x is. Well, I can just draw a line up until where it in, in, in intersects our graph and then draw a line over. And that's going to give me f of x, okay? And further, what's really interesting, right, is um, every graph that you have in the plane, 
right? Um, is the set of solutions to an equation, right? In this case, this is the graph of the equation y equals f of x, right? And and I know that there's, you know, traditionally a little bit of confusion about, you know, what is y, what is f of x, right? f of x is the function that takes in elements of the domain and outputs something in the range, okay? Y, if, if, if we assign Y to equal F of X, that's how we get the graph, okay? And this will be tremendously useful, right? Because it's gonna give us a visual intuition. So how do we go about creating these graphs, right? Um, well, the most obvious way, right, is simply by plotting points. Say we have, for example, this set of axes here, and we want to graph, um, say, f of x is x squared plus 1. And we want to graph that. Okay, we can form our little table of values, f or x and y equals f of x. Hopefully that's enough room. So we just want to pick a series of values until we feel like we have a good idea of what's going on in this graph. So if x equals 1, well, we square it and add 1. So 1. So we know this point is on there. What about 1? Well, 1 squared is 1 plus 1 is 2, right? And what's worth noting um, is that for these parabolas, they're symmetric about the y-axis, right? For, for things that look like this specifically, they're going to be symmetric about the y-axis because, well, any time I square a negative number, I'm going to get the same thing, right? So that means for plus 1 and minus 1, our, our output is 2. Okay. What about plus or minus 2? Well, 2 squared is 4, plus 1 is 5. Okay, so 2, 3, 4, 5. And then, well, at plus or minus 3, we're going to square it for 9 and add 1 for 10. So we get 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And from here, we can get a good idea of what's going on. If, if, if you didn't uh, necessarily want to graph this by plotting points, right, you could graph this um, as a function transformation, right? f of x, well, it's the graph of x squared shifted up by one unit, OK? Um, having a really good understanding and, and foundation in, in these parent graphs um, you know, like your x squared, your x cubed, your square roots of x's, all of those, and then how function transformations work, um, that will serve you extremely well in calculus, okay? So, so, so that way you can go from this function to the idea of the graph very, very quickly, okay? So let's take a look at one that's a bit more complicated. Let's try the function g of x, which is a piecewise function. So it's negative x if x is less than 0. And it's the square root of x if x is greater than or equal to 0. Right? The moment we see the square root, we should have some you know, warning lights going off just to make sure that there's no domain issues. But it's only the square root of x if we're greater than or equal to 0. So we're in a good place, okay? How would we graph this? Well, there's a number of ways to think about it, okay? We're, we're gonna have to split this up into the two subdomains, right? Each of these pieces of our piecewise function. If x is negative, well, then we're graphing negative x, right? So if x is over here, we're graphing the negative of it. 
okay? So if we're at, if we're at negative one, we want to graph negative negative one or positive one, right? If we're at x equals negative two, we want to graph negative negative two or positive two. And you can sort of see how this is going. We're gonna get it going up and to the right, okay? And we do want to right at first draw a, a, a little open circle there, right? Because this is only strictly less than zero. We don't know what's happening at zero. It's not defined by this guy. So we draw this open circle to indicate that it's gonna approach there, but it's never quite gonna get there, okay? Um, what's happening on this section here? Well, if x is greater than or equal to zero, so this side, right? Uh, we're gonna graph the square root of x. The first thing we should figure out is what's happening at zero, right? Because our previous part left that up in the air. Well, if x equals zero, then we're here and we're taking the square root of zero, which is, well, it's zero, so we can fill in that dot, right? We don't need an, an open dot anymore there because we know what it's doing, right? Well, okay, so what's this guy gonna look like? Well, just picking some points, right? Uh, I know at one, my square root is going to be one. I know at four, my square root is gonna be two. I know at uh, nine, so five, six, seven, eight, nine, my square root is going to be three. And this guy looks like a parabola turned on its side, this guy is going to increase, um, but very, very slowly, okay? So, so we have these um, graphs, right? Um, and we saw that we can graph these functions by taking our function, creating an equation, y equals f of x, for that function and then graphing that equation, okay? So again, you know, this graph here, this is the graph of y equals g of x, okay? But can you always go the other way, right? We can always go from function to equation given some arbitrary e e equation or even some arbitrary graph, can you always go the other way? Well, let's investigate, All right? Let's consider this graph right here. Looks pretty similar to what we were just doing. Let's consider this guy right here, okay? This is the graph of y squared equals x, okay? Does this graph have an associated function? Well, if it did, we would need to be able to put it in terms of y equals f of x, right? So let's try and do that, right? We have this equation involving x and y, so why don't we just take square roots? This is gonna end up with uh, y equals plus or minus the square root of x, right? And we, we, we know that this plus or minus ne needs to be there um, for, for two reasons. One, because that's just what happens when you take square roots, you pick up a plus or a minus, or a, a, a plus and a minus. But, but more than that, I want you to notice here that for a given value of x, well, we have plus its square root and minus its square root, right? Both of those show up, right? You know, for a given value of x, we have this guy, right? If this is x, that's plus the square root of x, and that's minus square root of x. Well, perfect, you say. We have our function here, right? So we can write y equals, I don't know, say h of x, 
which is plus or minus the square root of x. That's great, right? But, uh, hmm. What I notice here right away is uh, when I feed in one value of x, I'm getting two. And that's bad, right? Because we said a function can only have one output per input. So the answer is no, right? That's, that's a problem because we found one counterexample. So it's not true that any graph can be turned into a function because this graph can't be turned into a function, okay? But can, can we use this in order to tell us or, or, or to, to, to develop a rule or a test for when going the other way is possible? And indeed we can, okay? It's something called the vertical line test. And it goes like this, okay? A curve in the xy plane is the graph of a function, not just, just an equation, but a function if and only if, if and only if uh, each vertical line intersects the graph uh, at, at most one point. Okay. And this is sort of using this idea that we discovered here, right? The problem with this is that when we take square roots, this input now has two outputs right? And that's a problem, right? Because, well, we're mapping one point to more than one point. And what that shows up as is that these two points on our graph lie on the same vertical line, right? And so that's where this idea of a vertical line test comes from. So now what, what, what we can do, I'll go over here for this. I always feel bad leaving that much room on the previous page, but it's one of the advantages of the iPad over paper is that, you know, you can't necessarily waste a bunch of space by going to the next page, or rather you, you don't waste a bunch of paper. So let's just throw down some axes, a whole bunch of them. And this vertical line test allows us to very quickly tell whether or not any given graph is a function, right? Let's, let's start nice and simple. What about something like this? Well, if I grab a vertical line and I sweep this across my graph, it only ever hits it once, okay? So that means this guy is good, right? What about, um, what if I go the other way? Right? What if I have something like this, right, where we continue this way and continue that way? Well, we're not really good anywhere, right? Maybe if, if this guy continues arbitrarily this way, then we'd be good for a little bit. But here, well, here we get one, two, three points on the same line. So no, that graph is not tied to a function, okay? What about something like this? We're going to go like that, and we're going to go like that. Well, this one, we only hit it once, we only hit it once, we only hit it once. We're not hitting it at all here, right? It would seem like whatever's going on here is outside of our domain. So we go here, we're still only hitting it once, right? It doesn't matter that it's not hitting it at, at all here, right? Because our definition of the vertical line test it says that it intersects it at, at most one point. So it can intersect it at zero points, right? Um, what about something like this? Well, you know, your, your vertical line should be itching to 
place it right there and get what how many one two three four it's like five six seven eight nine no <laughs> right not at all this is not a function in any way right let's take another look at something like this something like this guy well if we grab our vertical line we can sweep it across Yes, there's sort of a like pinch point right there, but it only ever outputs one thing, right? So that one's good, right? Guess we need one more. So let's continue playing with this theme. So let's have it do something like this, right? It intersects the x-axis all the way there. Let's grab our vertical line and take a look. We're good here, we're good here, but then the moment we're right here, well, this is bad, right? We've got a failure right there. We've got a failure right there. In, in fact, the, we, we don't even need more than one failure, right? The moment that you have a single point, you know, a, a, a like single vertical line that intersects the graph more than once, you failed the vertical line test and your graph does not have a function. So with this uh, strange pages of, of uh, doodles, um, that's where we're going to end it for the day. Come back on Thursday where we will uh, keep talking about um, these functions um, and kind of how to do some algebra with them. Uh, and then we will introduce um, our sort of first big um, calculus topic called limits.